I'd like you to look at that dot on the end of the arrow in this photograph, which is, of course, a negative. That dot looks like a star, but it's not a star. It's something very much more dramatic. It's what we call a quasar, and it's shining as brightly as hundreds of whole galaxies put together. Good evening. Actually, we've known about quasars since 1963, because many of them are very powerful radio sources, and they can be studied, therefore, by means of radio telescopes. And the most famous radio telescope in the world is still the great 250-foot dish at Jodrell Bank in Cheshire. But it soon became clear that quasars really were absolutely incredible. And for one thing, they were immensely luminous. Now, a galaxy, such as our own, contains roughly 100,000 million stars. And can you just imagine, therefore, the combined luminosity of hundreds of those systems put together? But that is a quasar, all contained inside an area which is relatively small, no bigger than, or about the size, of the solar system at most. So what can cause it? All kinds of rather strange theories came to light. One was that the um, quasar power might be due to chains of exploding stars going off one after the other. But that didn't seem to work. There was no reason for it. Then, um, what about that curious thing, antimatter? That didn't seem to work either. And then, could quasars be powered by vast black holes? Well, that was a bit better, but it still didn't seem to be the true answer. And also, it became clear that quasars are racing away very quickly. Now we know that the entire universe is in a state of expansion. And once you get beyond our own local group of galaxies, then all the galaxies are racing away from us, and the further away they are, the faster they're going. But quasars are much more luminous than normal galaxies, and therefore we can see them out to greater distances. And we know they're receding, and we know the rate at which they're receding, because of what is called the red shift. Light is a wave motion. When you look at the spectrum of a star, or that of a galaxy, which of course is a jumble of many millions of stars, or for that matter, an ordinary quasar, what you see is a rainbow background crossed by dark lines. And each one of those dark lines is characteristic of one particular element or group of elements. Now, if the object is moving away from you, then fewer light waves per second enter your eye than would be the case if the object were standing still. So the wavelength is effectively lengthened, and the object appears a little bit too red. Now, you can't normally notice any color change. It's too slight. But it does show up in the spectrum, and all the lines are shifted over to the long wave or red end of the spectrum. And the more the lines are red shifted, then the faster the thing is going away. And that's how we can tell that the universe is expanding, and that does apply to the quasars. And, as I've said, the further away they are, the faster they are going, and clearly we aim to see out to great depths. And quasars give us the best chance of doing that because they are so luminous. For a long time, the record was held by a quasar called OQ172. And there it is, again, the little dot on the end of the arrow. And that seems to be something like 10,000 million light years away at least. But it's no longer the holder of the distance record. After a long search, a more remote quasar was discovered, and this came to light at the Parkes Radio Astronomy Observatory in New South Wales. And there's the great 210-foot dish at Parkes. They discovered a quasar, which appeared to be a very long way away, and they contacted the optical astronomers at the Siding Spring Observatory, not very many miles away, and there the great Anglo-Australian telescope was used to identify this quasar optically. And here it is. We call it PKS 2000-330. And that has a redshift, indicating that it's going away from us at something like 90% of the speed of light, and that works out at a distance of, well, shall we say, 13,000 million light years. In which case, we are seeing it, not as it is now, but as it used to be 13,000 million years ago. But if the rule of the further, the faster holds good, then you are going to come to a distance at which an object, be it galaxy or quasar, is moving away at the actual speed of light, which is 186,000 miles a second. And, of course, in that case, you won't be able to see it at all. And we will have got to the boundary of the observable universe, though not necessarily that of the universe itself. And that's what we very much want to do. We want to look out to great depths. And now there's been a most exciting discovery, a quasar which is further away than any previously known. And it was discovered with the aid of plates taken with the UK Schmidt telescope, also at Siding Spring. It's very faint, 
objects in the southern part of the sky in the constellation of Sculptor, and it appears to be definitely further away than the previous record holder. Well, to tell us more about quasars, uh, who better than one of the world's greatest radio astronomers, who also happens to be astronomer royal, Professor Sir Francis Graham Smith. Graham, welcome back to the sky at night. First, how was this discovery made? You have to realize that to sort out a quasar from all the stars and galaxies that are in the sky is like looking for a needle in a haystack. If you take a photograph with any telescope, you see a lot of stars and you see a lot of galaxies and you see some quasars and they, they really all look very much alike. A new technique's been developed by astronomers at Cambridge, in particular Stephen Warren and Paul Hewitt, who have been able to sort out the, the, uh, the needle from the, from the haystack. They've used the Schmidt telescope again, and they've used a means of analyzing the plates from it. They use a machine called the automatic plate measurer at Cambridge. And in this way, they can look at many objects, for example, 30,000 objects or so on one of those Schmidt plates and decide which ones are likely candidates for quasars. They do this actually by taking five plates of each area of the sky using different color filters and they're looking at the color characteristics of the quasar. So in point of fact, this new discovery was made optically, but all the early quasar work was done by means of radio astronomy, wasn't it? Yes, that's right. The, the previous record holder, PKS 2000, that was discovered as a radio object, and the radio astronomers told the optical astronomers where to look. Now we haven't got that help, and the, uh, the interesting thing is that the radio used to sort out these objects quite easily because they stood out, and they don't stand out optically. However, we do know there are at least as many uh, radio quiet optical quasars as the ones we would have picked out by the radio. Well, how are you going to pick them out? That's the real problem. Yes. You see, you've got a, a plate from the Schmidt telescope, which is like this, an enormous thing. It's covered with dots. If we look at a, a print from this, then we can see the, the myriads of images on it. And the closer you look, the more you see. And they're all just little dots, nearly all of them are, and it's very hard just from one plate, impossible from one plate, to find out if they have, say, a different color. What really matters is that the quasars do have different color of light. They have a different spectrum. If we go back to your um, PKS 2000 again and have a look at that, you can see that the image on any one plate looks like well, any star image. But if you can put that light into a big spectrograph on a big telescope, like the Anglo-Australian telescope, you see a spectrum spread out like this, which is very characteristic of a quasar. Look at that very prominent spectral line in the middle. That actually comes from hydrogen, and it was emitted at a wavelength which is one-fifth of the wavelength we're now receiving it. And that means that the familiar spectral lines in the optical spectrum have been moved right out into the red end of the spectrum. So the way of recognizing quasars is to recognize them by their spectrum by taking these five colored photographs and using this new automatic machine and the new technique which has been developed by Stephen Warren and Paul Hewitt. Well, if the red shifts in the spectra are reliable as distance guides, and there's no reason to suppose they aren't, then we are talking about something that may be 13,000 million light years away. In other words, we are seeing it as it used to be 13,000 million years ago. Yes, that's right. I think it's quite a good idea to talk about ages, and particularly to talk about ages in relation to the age of the universe. And we're actually looking nine-tenths of the way back to the time when the universe began. That, that might perhaps best be shown on this clock face. But what we have here is a clock face which is 12 hours, but the 12-hour clock face is meant to represent the whole age of the universe. It means that the span of human existence is going to be a minute amount, the odd second. Um, but we're going to turn the clock back now and see if we can see how the quasar fits in with the time scale of the universe. Now what we're doing, we're going back to the time when life began on Earth, which is at about one third of the age of the universe. Here we are. During that time, you've got the geological record of life on Earth. Before that time, you have to turn to the quasars and the galaxies. If you want to go to about half the age of the universe, you can do that with ordinary galaxies um, and some of the quasars with not too much difficulty. What we've got now is quasars which will take us back all the way to 
the time when the universe was one-tenth of its present age. Here we go, working our way all the way back to one-tenth of the age of the universe. That's it. And that is why this is so important. The astronomy that we're doing is studying the universe when it was very young. And of course, this kind of work is where optical astronomy and radio astronomy really come together. Well, they do. It's, it's really a very interesting thing. The optical astronomy can get the, the redshift and the details of that spectrum. But radio astronomy can give you a map. Now, looking on an optical photograph, like the PKS 2000 we showed you, you just see a little dot, nothing more. Radio, surprisingly, can give you some details, a detailed picture of the quasar. In fact, it's a picture of the radio emission that's coming from it. Look at this object. This is a quasar. It's actually a rather nearby one, 3C273. The object at the top left there is what you see in an optical telescope, a bright dot. But sticking out from it is this jet-like object. In fact, it is a jet. It's been ejected from the quasar itself. It's very energetic gas, it's emitting radio waves, and this is actually a map of the radio emission from the quasar. And we, we are making maps of this and beginning to understand not only why it's radiating, but where the energy originates to send this jet out, and then also what happens when the, the jet of material hits the gas in the galaxy and churns around, creates magnetic field, high energy particles, and you get that radiation. Now this is obviously very valuable, but it's not obvious at first sight how you can draw a map of such detail in the radio domain when you can't do it in the optical domain. Now, there's a general rule that the more detail you have on the map, the bigger the telescope you need to do it. It's fairly obvious. But in the radio domain, that means something very much bigger than the Mark I telescope, which we've already seen in this program, familiar thing. You need a telescope which isn't like 100 meters across, but 100 kilometers across. Well, strangely enough, we can do that now. Uh, if we look at uh, what we're doing at Jodrell Bank these days, we actually have a network of radio telescopes which covers the country. There's one recently added to them which is as far away as Cambridge, and that's 200 kilometers away. All those telescopes are connected back to Jodrell Bank by microwave links, and they all work together in a network which we call MERLIN, Multi-Element Radio Linked Interferometer Network, <laughs> MERLIN. And uh, that actually creates for us a telescope which is one or 200 kilometers across and enables us to draw these very accurate maps. Some of the detail we need in the maps needs an even larger telescope. And for that, we connect ourselves up to other radio telescopes overseas. There's one in America called the Very Large Array, for example. And we find ourselves cooperating with people from other countries to put these maps together. In particular, we've recently been uh, collaborating with some Canadian colleagues, Anne Gower is one of them, and drawing a map of a very distant quasar. And uh, this is, in fact, the map that we've recently drawn, a very exciting object. Again the optical picture would just show one bright blob, as it happens, the one in the middle of this picture. But the radio emission comes from these jets which have been shot out from it. And there's one down at the bottom and a very interesting one at the top of the picture. The jet is um, showing a curious shape, which is uh, rather like a jet of water hitting something and spewing around as it does so. So we're looking at the physical interaction of a quasar with its surroundings. We've learned a great deal about quasars now, but what exactly is the energy source? What produces this tremendous amount of radiation? It's something to do with the concentration of material uh, at the center of the galaxy. And this seems to happen more in galaxies near the early stages of the universe. There must be um, a massive concentration, either of many stars or of an actual black hole. And this is attracting material, stars, to fall in. And as they fall in, they release energy. We see the release of energy as a jet or two jets which spew out along perhaps a rotation axis. Uh, the optical pictures show the excitation of the gas around, very hot gas and so on. But we're fairly sure it's basically gravitational energy. We'd like to know more about that, an interesting source of energy, uh, and we'd also like to know the physical conditions around it a little bit more detail.
We've now probed out further than ever before, and we've come to this new quasar with what they call a Z value of 4.01. But what exactly is Z? What does it mean? Well, Z's a measurement of distance, in fact, although we measure it as a change of wavelength of the light which is received. Uh, if we, well, to start off with, close by Z equals zero, because uh, there, there is no redshift. But if we go to Z equals one, for example, that's not very far away. That's uh, where the, 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 the wavelength has been stretched, actually, to double its original value. So here's a spectrum of light at z equals 1, still in the optical range of wavelengths. If you go a bit further to z equals 2, there are galaxies with z equals 2, then you can see the light is stretched towards the red end, and in fact there's less light in the optical range. z equals 3 takes it even further. The light is now moving out from the optical range into the red end. And z equals 4, where we've recently got to, you can see that the light, a very large part of it, has moved out of the optical range which, of course, makes it much more difficult to detect the quasar. The, it's, it's weak because it's a long way away. The light has moved out of the optical range and made it much more difficult to detect. So this is actually quite an achievement to get to Z equals 4. How much further can we go? Well, uh, Z equals 4 is a, is, a, is a kind of a boundary which people thought we would never get past. It's rather like the four-minute mile to get to Z equals 4, <laughs> and 4.01 is a real achievement. I think it's very likely that we shall get to Z equals 5, uh, beyond that, the technique probably gives up, and I think the Cambridge people are hoping to get to Z equals 5 and probably open a big bottle of champagne when they do. I am sure they will. After all, I think it's generally agreed that the limit of where an object is receding at the speed of light is somewhere between 15,000 million and 20,000 million light years. Um, are we anywhere near that limit now, you think? Well, we're about nine-tenths towards it, but we may not get very much further. The, the problem is that, well, there are two problems. First, it's more and more difficult to, to find and detect and measure the quasars. Second, there may not be any beyond there, because we are certainly reaching a point in the universe where things are different from the, the local universe. And it, it may not be worthwhile looking for more, more quasars further away. There just may not be any. I wonder if there are. Meanwhile, this new discovery was made optically. And I gather that this, uh, this very distant quasar is not yet showing any signs of being a radio source, which is interesting. Well, that's true. We are, in fact, I can let you into a secret, having a good look at it right now at Jodrell Bank with a very sensitive interferometer. And it is quite certain it is a very radio-weak quasar if it's detectable at all. I wonder. On the whole, what do you think is the greatest significance of this new discovery? I think the significance is the cosmological significance. There is, is of course, the, the excitement of the physics of what's going on, the heavy mass and so forth. But what about the history of the universe when we are at last seeing beyond what we might call the local universe into a time which was rather near the origin of the universe when we can see the galaxies forming? There was a time, obviously, when the, uniform was quite, when the universe was entirely uniform. That time passed shortly before this galaxy was radiating to us. And now we can see a time when the galaxies, the stars, the quasars were forming. And that's exciting to get into the history of the universe. It most certainly is, Graham. Thank you very much. And isn't it satisfying, too, that so much of this research is due to British astronomers? Not only Jodrell Bank and Merlin have the Australian telescope, the Canadian telescopes, and so on. And, you know, it really is quite breathtaking to reflect that when you look at that tiny dot on the picture, we are seeing something not as it is now, but as it used to be when the universe was very, very young. Good night.